In the last video, we looked at auto mounting and installing some applications. And in this video, there's a few things that we might have left out that I'm going to cover. Mounting NTFS drives is something which I get asked quite a lot. Uh, it's quite understandable, really, considering that many people have them lying around. And following on from the last video when we did some auto mounting, which was really just for some uh, FAT32 drives, I thought that I would cover NTFS. So I've plugged in a USB stick that's been formatted with NTFS and it doesn't pop up automatically. So having a look at DMessage, uh, all right, I need to get into uh, Duas. And yes, the actual drive has been detected. The thumb drive has been detected. So I'll just clear that. What we're going to do, is we're going to install some Fuse packages. Now Fuse allows you to interact with file systems, etc. That's not native to your system. And we'll do a quick search. There's a few that I want to add on. Fuse NTFS is already installed in this uh, test machine. But if not, then just look at the instructions on the screen. It says FuseFS XFAT. Uh, and all the way down to FuseFS NTFS, if you haven't already got it. But because I've already got it installed, the actual number of packages to be installed is smaller. And to be honest, they'll come in useful later on. So once that's been installed, and I'm going to restart the dev. I mean, I don't know if we need to do that, but it's false of habit, really, I suppose. Now we're going to edit the rc.conf. And just at the bottom there, I'm going to add Fuse underscore enable equal... Yes. And that will start this, the uh, the fuse when we first start the machine up. Now we're going to go into bootloader.conf. I'm going to add at the bottom of that fuse underscore load equal yes. And that will load the kernel module. I can restart again. Like again, I don't know if you need to do this, but it's uh, something that I like to do. And most essentially to actually use it now rather than start the machine. We're just going to load the kernel module now. So fuse, fs, and that should be it. So because the USB is already plugged in, I'm just going to mount it manually. And yep, it worked. That's fine. Just uh, close that down. Right, so that works. I'm just going to pull out the USB stick and plug it back in and see if it auto mounts. There, that's fantastic. So it auto mounted it and opened up the Dolphin file manager as usual, which is very nice on the NTFS drive. And that's it. That's all you need to do. And just to have a look at the drive using Gpart. DA0, there you go, is NTFS active. Very nice indeed. And in case you're wondering, yes, you can actually write to it. So I'm just going to mount it manually again and create a new folder. There we go, if you can manage to do it. There you go. So yes, perfectly usable, read and writable, wonderful. Something else we didn't do last time, and this is really to set drive permissions so you can access scanners, printers, etc. So we're going to edit forward slash etc. forward slash devfs.com and scroll the way down to the bottom again. Just on that bit. Yeah. And we're first going to add this little rem line just to, so we don't forget what it is. And we're going to allow users to access optical media. So there's a lot of people that still use DVDs or even CD-ROMs. There's quite a few to add. So I'm just going to do a few now and then we'll fast forward and finish it off. One thing that is really useful, there is a website called Cool Trainer. It has been updated for a while now, but it's still very much pertinent really what we're doing. And there's a section there covering, there we are, devfs.com. So just basically copy all that. There's some bits at the bottom we're going to trim off and paste it in. Saves you from typing it all out. There's no point in doing that if you, if you can get around it. We're just going to delete these. These are for TV adapters. Now, if you've got a TV adapter and you want to use it, then keep these. If not, you might as well just get rid of it. And there we go. So the scanner permissions and external drive, etc. So I'm just going to clear that. And the next bit we're going to do is we're going to edit the DevFS rules. This goes hand in hand, really, with what we've just done. There's nothing in this file, so we're going to have to create it from scratch. So DevFS rules underscore common equals seven. It doesn't matter what you really call it as long as each rule set has a unique name and number. So the next bit we're going to add path. This really defines 
what we're looking out for, what we want the system to look out for. In this case, ADA, so, you know, we're looking out for internal drives from numbers from 0 to 9. It means it can be mounted. And same for external drives and CDs and cards and all lovely things, like the USBs. So again, like before, we're just going to copy this and paste it in. Just tidy up a bit, and there we go. Just delete the ones we don't want, and there we go. And everything looks, uh, everything looks good. This allows us to access the various things we want to plug in. Next, we're going to edit rc.conf, and we're going to add that rule set that we defined. There we go, devfs underscore system underscore rule set and the name of the rule set we used. Next, we're going to do a simple firewall using IPFW. And this is one which has worked for me uh, very well, so I'm, I'm just going to use this one. So we go to rc.conf, we go to the bottom, and we add firewall underscore enable yes. So it does when uh, the system starts up. Next is firewall underscore quiet. So really, we don't want uh, lots of text scrolling on the screen, unless you do, of course, in which case, but no. And this one, because we're using a desktop, it's going to use workstation. Because if you're using a server, or you might want an alternative, or use a different type of firewall. Firewall underscore my services are what you want to be able to access uh, on your machine. So if you want to SSH in or out, or web, etc., email, then you need to put them there. Firewall underscore allow services. We'll put that to any. Uh, log deny. You don't have to use exact ones, of course. You can, uh, and I actually fully recommend that you look up the different options available once to suit your own machine. But these ones will get you will get you set up nicely. I'll leave a copy of this uh, firewall rule set in the description box down below, and we'll start the firewall now using service IP FW one start. You won't need to do that again if you start the machine up. It does because uh, we need to get it going now. I'll use that, and there we go. Firewall rules loaded. We're just going to change the package repository to the latest. Now, when you install FreeBSD, it will automatically come with really the system pointing at quarterly rather than latest. The difference being is quarterly usually is three months behind. So every three months, you know, it'll update them a lot. And by that time, the latest ones have moved on a little bit further. So obviously the latest is meant to be the latest software. And, and so if you follow that particular PKG, uh, that package tree, you will have to update more or you'll find more updates available. But quarterly is meant to be more stable and therefore not updated as much. It's not really out of date software, but it's, like I say, about three months behind. Now, if you're using a production machine or you don't mind this, then fine, just, just leave it at the default. So what we're doing this part is that I'll show you how to update the system to use to update the system to use latest rather than quarterly, and we'll do a few upgrades of the packages if there are any upgrades available.
Anyway, that's the end of this video. And for now, the end of getting started with FreeBSD on the desktop. It's a bit more work to do it this way. You could use an off-the-shelf solution, say, for instance, GhostBSD or NomadBSD. And while they're fine OSs in, this, in their own right, they're tailored very much to the taste of the developers themselves. Now, if that doesn't bother you, fine, load one up, and that's what they're really meant for. But if you want to make FreeBSD something special to you, then doing it a manual way, doing it the old-fashioned way, uh, you can't beat it. There's a little bit more work involved, yes, and you'll probably learn something about the system as you do it as well. And you no doubt you'll probably mess it up too. But you know you get there, and you learn it, and it becomes almost like second nature in the end, really. You know, you know which files to tweak and which uh, things to allow, etc. And the result is a super stable operating system. Uh, it's as quick as anything that you're going to find anywhere else. And whilst this guide really can't go into every single nuance and detail uh, that someone may need, hopefully it's provided you with the bare bones, really, the, the skeleton in which to build your wonderful system. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Yeah.